Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the ranks are filling up. Um, we are moving to our next session. I'd like to, I'm very, very much looking forward to this session because it's another session which um, is at a very uh, high point in uh, drivers of, of these markets. And I'd like to call on stage uh, Matthew Bishop first, who will moderate and introduce the session. Matthew, a warm applause to Matthew Bishop. Hey. Matthew, hello. We sit one sec, um, second, just because before we in, uh, introduce. Uh, Matthew is a, also a fr friend from Davos, uh, from the YGLs, and um, you are here the second time. Um, and we're happy that you come back. May I int welcome. Introduce Matthew to you. Matthew is um, for uh, the last 18 years, may I say, so um, working with The Economist. So. I think the most prestigious brand and magazine um, that there is right now in, in business, politics, on a global base. The Economist is an enormous success story uh, over the last 10 years. Why? Why? <laughs> <laughs> Simple question to start the morning off. No. So we, we seem to be growing at about 9% a year. Our circulation is now about 1.4 million yeah. worldwide, double yeah. what it was 10 years ago. Yeah. I think there's an appetite amongst a certain part of the world population to read about what's going on in the world and to think about the yeah. difficult issues we're confronting. So I think that's why we're growing. Everybody else seems to be abandoning the high ground and uh, heading for the uh, hills. So exactly. So you, for the valleys, rather. <laughs> and you're also a, a voice that, that also has a, a standpoint. And mm -hmm. I think that's very much part of the history of The Economist. About yourself, you, you're the chief business writer. Mm -hmm. So many CEOs know you. And you also wrote two books um, lately. One book you presented last year that was on philanthropic capitalism. Mm -hmm. Two words, what was the idea for the book? So philanthropic capitalism uh, was a book about how um, there is a movement to bring together the head and the heart, uh, to bring together the business world and the uh, social change world to actually uh, solve some of the world's biggest problems. It touches on uh, people like Bill Gates, um, people like George Soros, uh, who, people like Michael Bloomberg, who are using their philanthropy to um, do very different things, but also looking at how business uh, is increasingly trying to tap into values um, and to try and be part of the solution to the public, to the global problems, rather than adding to those problems. And, um, and now, basically, you're bringing a new book uh, to DLD, which is not published so far, which will be published next week. And the title is The Road from Ruin. Um, there's some humor in that or some... There uh... <laughs> well, there's some hope. I mean, the, the book has the, um, the subtitle. It's only uh, um, How to Revive Capitalism and Put America Back on Top. The second part of that title, the subtitle, you may wonder why put America back on top. Why would a Brit possibly want America to be back on top? Um, firstly, I should say this is a book we're selling initially in America. So we thought a bit of marketing would be quite clever on that point. But secondly, America is the world's biggest economy still. Um, unless we can get the American economy moving again, the rest of the world is going to have a very tough time over the next few years. And secondly, in the book, we're trying to argue that America needs to take a different view of being on top. It needs to build uh, the infrastructure for a successful global economy rather than uh, just see itself as competing with everybody else. And so I'm trying to... Uh, suggest a different form of leadership for America over the next few years. Okay, um, so uh, you have a panel today, a discussion yes. with three investors, different types. The floor is here to discuss global capital, what's changing. I, I, I will ask you now to introduce the panelists and start the debate. Okay, look, do come up. Uh, <laughs> we have three panelists. Um, first coming up is, uh, is Christian, uh, who has his own uh, private um, uh, fund management business. Um, to my immediate left is uh, Philip, who's uh, working with KKR, the private equity firm for the last um, nine years. And then to my right is Uwe, who manages, um, among other things, uh, the, the money of the, one of the founders of SAP. Um, we couldn't have a better panel. My, uh, I'm gonna, my book is about uh, the discontinuity that I believe is going on at the moment in the world. We start, I start with the phrase, on September the 15th, 2008, capitalism as we knew it ended. Um, 
that was the day that Lehman Brothers went bust. And the reason I'm saying that that version of capitalism ended was that I think it was not just about a banking failure, but about a failure of a whole set of ideas about uh, capital, about capitalism, about the role of the market versus the role of the state, that um, over the previous 25 years, capitalism had been the almost unquestioned ideology, and the, and the version of capitalism that was dominant was one that said, leave it to the financial sector, capital will be spread to wherever the good ideas are, um, and risks will be managed better in society. And I think that looks very different today. And so in the, the rest of the book, um, I wanted to set out a series of ideas uh, for how we can improve capitalism so that it actually does what it's supposed to do rather than um, uh, causing us to have massive bailouts of a system that uh, has been proven to be full of holes. We have these three uh, speakers now. I'm going to start by asking them um, really whether they agree that there is a crisis in capitalism at the moment and what they think have been the causes or the main causes of that crisis. And then we're going to go on and talk about what we see as uh, the new improved version that might come out uh, of this mess. And I'm going to start with Philip. Yes, uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, first of all, Matthew, I have to apologize. I know you wanted me to read your uh, first chapter, which I have to admit I haven't done, so I'll improvise a bit. Um, to your question, I think you're spot on. This is somewhat ironic that we are sitting here because President Obama a few days ago has suggested a legislation that goes as far, if not further, than what um, Teddy Roosevelt has done in, um, in 1933. And I think for good reason. Um, as you say, it is not merely a crisis of the financial system. I think the financial system breakdown, which was very much a near-death experience, really was indicative of a near-death experience in our economic system. And that, in turn, was really you know, indicative of a deeper societal and moral problem that we have in Western society. I'm sure we're going to talk more about it. The unfortunate reality is that we have no population growth and that there is a limit to how much productivity growth we have without fundamental innovation. And I think that's what this room is all about. And the problem is, if you don't have fundamental growth, you cannot keep increasing your standard of living um, uh, without actually taking on debt. And that's, I think, what the financial system, um, politicians, um, everybody has embraced over the last 20 years to think we can keep living a better life without working hard and without creating fundamental value. And that has fundamentally failed. Uh, Christian. Okay, first, uh, I would say we don't have a crisis of capitalism. Of course, it's easy to say it, and, and the people mix up financial uh, system, capitalism, so they put up, put up everything in one basket. But um, I still believe that capitalism is the only way how our society can work on an economic basis. But we do have a crisis in the financial system. Um, and the crisis is not a crisis. Maybe there have been some external factors yeah, um, who, who, who we might say caused the crisis, but the roots, the deeper roots of the crisis in the financial system uh, are in the financial system itself because uh, we did something wrong for 20, 30 years yeah, and there was something like blowing up and then there came a needle and there came some external factors yeah, who brought the, the deeper problems in the financial system to the sunlight. So we definitely have a crisis in the financial system, not in the capitalistic idea uh, itself. So what, do you, what are those deeper causes that you're referring to? From, from my point of view, one main point is that if you look on the, let's say, the banking system within the financial system, that over the last 50 years, 60 years, 70 years, and especially over the last 20 years, um, the banks grew bigger and bigger, yeah, what meant automatically that they became um, uh, manager-managed, meaning banks lost their entrepreneurial spirit. Yeah, I'm a deep believer that uh, there must be more entrepreneurship, really entrepreneurship, really liability yeah, by persons. Yeah, there, are, there are no any, the, the investment banks are no partnerships anymore and so on. So we need more entrepreneurship back in the financial systems and less big institutions. And second, um, the second idea is that the banks lost actually the connection to the, to the 
corporates or to the real world. Yeah, actually, if you look back 50, 100 years, there was a bank, and the reason of a bank was to finance corporates. And the, the, the guy who financed the corporates yeah, had the liability because he was the owner of the bank, and it was his money he was lending. And he knew if the corporate is defaulting, his money is gone. So, and then he made very reasonable thoughts. <laughs> Do I want to lend this guy the money, easily said, or do I want to uh, lend it, uh, do I not want to lend it? So now we have the big institutions, there is no connection between the guy who raises money on the financial market yeah, for a bond, whatever, he has absolute no connection yeah, to where the money goes. So, and, and this disconnection of the banks to the, to the real economy, yeah, combined with the, with the missing entrepreneurship and the missing liability, because a lot of problems we're discussing, like bonus things, whatever, would not happen if there would be entrepreneurs, yeah, owners of banks, yeah, who would uh, mediate the, the discussion. Yeah, I love this phrase that was used on Wall Street called IBG, YBG, which is I'll be gone, you'll be gone, by the time that the consequences of our decisions uh, uh, become clear. And I think that's one of the problems that you're you're referring to. Uwe, I mean, is this a crisis of capitalism? Actually, actually, I think it's more an imbalance and uh, uh, development, I agree partially, uh, uh, of uh, greediness, etc., in, in the banking system, which uh, uh, certainly should have been uh, put to a hold quite earlier. And uh, so in my point of view, uh, the problem is if you uh, give uh, uh, a certain bonus to somebody without really creating value that you can uh, prove and that is uh, a lasting value for, for the economy or for the business itself, and I see banks as businesses as well, then there's a, uh, something uh, in a disorder. And uh, so that's the reason why we actually use banks only as a service provider and not as a, a banking uh, uh, you know, authority in, in any class, asset class, because uh, they only want to make money and they want to make short-sighted money and that's uh, uh, the wrong way. If you manage a bank like a business, then you have to have a long-term perspective and a long-term return and then you can uh, give a certain, uh, write a certain check but uh, there's a certain imbalance uh, in what the bank does and what uh, the returns, especially for the responsible bankers are. And uh, that's uh, something that has to be cured and, and actually I'm uh, more liberal, uh, economic liberal, and so in my point of view, the governments would have been uh, doing good to let actually the economy do its uh, balancing and that if that would have meant uh, to the head of other banks like Lehman Go Bust, uh, I wouldn't have mind. I mean, that's a, a big, uh, I mean, a big statement to make because I think if uh, the government in the U.S. and around the world hadn't intervened at that point, probably the entire system of major banks would have would have gone bust. Um, Switzerland's banks would have gone bust. Uh, Goldman Sachs, maybe even J.P. Morgan would have gone out of business. Perhaps HSBC even, which is the one that was least touched by this crisis. I mean, do you, do you really think the government couldn't uh, could have actually let this whole system uh, do what capitalist systems are in theory supposed to do? I think they um, had a big opportunity to address a wider issue. I do agree with you that they couldn't have let other institutions go bust simply because um, the way that the financial system had evolved, it was too interconnected to do that. I mean, as I said, it's a near-death experience. However, what they missed is a unique moment to use the widespread disillusion with the system to impose the right recipes, such as if you bail institutions out, you charge appropriate fees for that, right? I mean, what Obama did a few days ago with charging um, a fee on the liabilities of a bank is, is correct because you cannot um, l let that go unpunished without risking further crises down the road. Um, but what I also would like to say, it goes much further than that. You know, let me ask you a question. What is more ir irresponsible uh, to let the you know, financial system go unpunished, as you are implying, or to pass short-term fiscal measures such as the cash for clunkers or other me measures, bail out General Motors, you know, fundamentally challenge industries and create an illusion to the, you know, kids of common people that jobs in that sector are safe. I think it is as irresponsible to do that as it is to um, you know, not having done a better job in the, in the banking uh, sector. I think that's the overall problem we have. I think we, all, we are all in this together. At the end of the day, 
the Western world is staring in the abyss. You know, Asia is working extremely hard and extremely cleverly. And unless we fundamentally innovate our way out of this, our standard of living will decrease. The fact is that in the US and in general in the Western world, the medium income of um, what we call you know, the mid-segment of the population has stagnated over the last 10 years. And the way to address that is not to create more distribution and say, you know, the pie has to be, um, you know, be redistributed and made fairer. That's an entirely different question. It is to grow the pie. And we can only grow the pie with fundamental innovation and a working financial system. I mean, I, I'm interested to, to hear you say that because it seems to me that in many ways this financial crisis is a failure of innovation. Um, that for the last 25 years, the financial markets have been driven by financial innovation, intellectual um, dynamism. And then you suddenly realize that all that amazing innovation appears to have actually made the world more of a mess than it was before. And I, I, I wonder, you know, where's the financial innovation going to come from? Obama's announcement last Friday appears to be an attempt to, Thursday appears to be a, an attempt to, to say, let's stop innovating in finance and, oh. and let's roll back uh, the, the clock to the, the 1950s. But, so I really think financials, or let's say again, banks, they don't need innovations. Banking is a very easy business. Yeah, as Uwe said, he wants a bank who serves him as a client, yeah, who is a service provider. Yeah, private clients want to deposit their money and they want to lend money when they need it. Corporates yeah, want lending, yeah, want some advisory. Yeah, but really financial uh, or banks don't need innovation. And I think that the problem of the innovation, yeah, and the people liked it for, for decades, yeah, was that the people believe that there is money coming out of money. Yeah, in former times, you, you believe that you need money, yeah, like a catalyst, to produce something. I, I always say to my colleagues, uh, in, in, especially in our investment bank, that we should not forget that a bank doesn't create value. Yeah, we don't build tables, we don't build cars, we don't build houses. Yeah, we just give the money to people who hopefully use the money to do proper things, to produce things, who are really the productive guys. Yeah, and what happened in banking is in innovation, which was the bad thing, that the bankers started to think that just by creating a financial product, just by making one layer over the other, somehow magical, yeah, we produce value out of design or out of uh, structuring. And there so is do you no think, way. So do you think the proposals that President Obama made last week are, are going to help improve the finance, take it back to where it should be? In general, yes. So I think that the banks need to be reduced uh, to what they should do. And I think, it's my personal opinion, it's a good idea. Yeah? I'm not the expert in, in complex, because it's really complex. Because if you're pushing the one button, you have a side effect on the other side. But yeah, to, to reduce or to, to split up the banks again, what they had in America for a long time, in investment banks, who are more aggressive or more who are, who are using their own money, whatever, yeah, it's totally fine. But they should not be combined with clients or with private people's money, yeah, who would be, which would be gone yeah, when the banks get bust. So, and then to split it into, into consumer banks, yeah, which are just uh, have the simple services to provide. Uwe, I mean, what are the consequences going to be of the Obama proposals? Well, actually, uh, uh, partially it will have a disastrous e effect in my point of view because the U.S. banks are the biggest investors in the hedge fund industry, so that's okay. Everybody knows hedge funds are a, a little bit, you know, uh, uh, too greedy sometimes, but they're also good ones. Uh, but actually, I think the most important impact will be on the private equity side. And if you consider that in the United States, almost 20% of the uh, 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 growth and of the GDP is generated by venture capital and private equity funded businesses, uh, uh, there will be a huge uh, uh, hit for the US economy in my point of view. And actually, the, the most interesting part is that Investing in private equity is exactly what you also stated the banks should have done earlier and invest in companies and give money to companies and they use intermediaries for that. And uh, that's, uh, I think, uh, uh, not pointing in the right direction. 
but, but, but uh, actually what Obama said, maybe not everyone uh, read it on Friday, is that he doesn't want to allow commercial banks who use the money of the people who, who have deposits of, of private clients, he doesn't want them to allow to invest in, uh, in risky assets, meaning in private equity and hedge funds. First, the hedge fund industry and the private equity industry, I really like them, so because they, we all mix it up with banks and actually the private equity guys and the hedge fund guys, they are much, much more entrepreneurial because they partly invest their own money, they just get money when they earn uh, returns hopefully for the clients so meaning they are the good ones yeah but you don't need the banks yeah which just contribute at the end 15% to the fundraising it's a lot but yeah you don't need the banks to finance them I'm surely I'm sure that there will be like family office like you who say okay if you don't why, why, why don't why, why do you need the banks you can invest the money directly in the hedge funds and the private equity industry meaning just that the banks are not allowed to do it will not mean that the private equity and the hedge fund industry will go bust yeah there will be new investors who say okay then I do it directly and I think it's more healthier if the people who invest in a private equity fund and in a hedge fund does it by himself and he has to think about it yeah because it's also these these uh, yeah these uh, neutralism that nobody thinks about what he's doing uh, anybody will do uh, the decision for me yeah and to bring the decision back to the people who invest their money is definitely a healthy thing so one of the things that um, I look at in my book the new, my new book is to go back to every bubble that burst in history, all the way back to tulip mania and the South Sea bubble, and to look at how government responded to uh, things going very wrong. And it's absolutely clear that where government responds by crunching down on the innovation, uh, always a bubble comes out of innovation of some kind. When the government reacts by banning the innovation, the problems get worse and they last for 20 years. When governments respond by making sure that, uh, and the markets respond by learning from the mistakes and learning how to use the innovation better. Uh, recovery tends to happen much quicker. Now my worry at the moment is that um, the way that the finance industry has responded to this crisis um, by denying there's a fundamental problem and by earning massive bonuses um, and massive profits is going to guarantee that the governments of the world uh, respond in a very populist and political way and crack down on and reduce control uh, the banking sector. Um, is that your fear? Do you think that's going to happen? And secondly, um, what do you think needs to be done so that we can actually get uh, going forward again and make sure that uh, the economies of the world start growing strongly again, particularly the developed world of Europe and America? Um, Uwe. Well, actually, uh, first of all, you have to think of, uh, of following. The banking system developed over the past, I would say, uh, 500 years, actually, if we take the Fugger from Augsburg. Uh, but let's say the modern uh, banking uh, uh, was started actually uh, in the, in the uh, time of the North American railroads. And uh, so the development was that uh, the, bonks, the banks actually uh, got more and more networked especially with the modern technology today, and many people here are from the new media industry, so they may understand this metaphor much better. So they, you have a huge network of many, many, many parts and many, many, you know, chips and, and processors. Uh, processors, I think, is a pretty good term for that. And uh, everything is, is linked together. And uh, the problem we had is that there was no, uh, let's say, a system administrator, as the new media world says, but uh, uh, everything was going, uh, you know, like crazy, like in the early days of the Internet. And the big issue we had, uh, for instance, uh, uh, the whole crisis was started in September to, uh, 2008 because of uh, actually uh, one person, so that's at least what I've heard and, and you can read it in his book. So one said, you know, if you don't accept this offer from Korea, we actually let you go bust. And that was the reason why actually Lehman failed, because the CEO of Lehman didn't want to accept an offer by South Korea to invest at a share price of $6.50 when the Lehman share already was at $2.70. And that's when Hank Paulson actually was, uh, let's say, a little bit upset, and then he actually uh, uh, pulled the plug. And uh, then the whole system got into trouble because they had to completely 
uh, re, re, uh, reassembled the system and the network because uh, everybody was linked to each uh, to the to another, and so uh, businesses that Lehman had done with other banks they had to be rolled up, etc. And then there was a lot of cash need because all uh, stuff that was generated over 20, 25 years had to be you know dissolved within a half a year, and that was I think uh, uh, the biggest issue. And what we need to have is a sysop, uh, as the new media world says, or an administrator that actually takes care of that the, the, the banking network works properly according to cer certain standards and uh, uh, good rules. And then actually uh, we will not see something like this again uh, happening. But uh, the problem is uh, what I always said, humans tend not to learn out of their mistakes uh, and that shows history. And so probably we will see something like this again. I think that's a very helpful point because it does seem to me that you know, this was a vast, modern, sophisticated, technology-based network, the financial system, where you did have a catastrophic failure, but the conclusions that uh, the politicians of the world seem to be drawing at the moment is that rather than improve the management of the network, we actually want to break the network up and take a large part of the capital out of the network so that it, uh, to my mind, won't be used in a very effective way and uh, we'll have a lot of problems as a result of that. Um, I actually think that's uh, too simplistic. Um, if you look at what the basic mistake is that is being made, and it comes back to the hubris of the Western world, right? Obama took over from George W. Bush saying, unilateralism is finished, and I will now sit down with the leaders of the world and come up with coordinated responses. What he has done now is to try and signal to the world that the United States can, by itself, do what you said, which is to you know, manufacture a reset of the global financial system. Quite honestly, you know, if you look at the reality of it, the top four of the uh, five largest banks in the world are Chinese banks today. We are missing a fundamental point, which is we in the West cannot solve this problem alone. And by just rushing into populistic measures like that, he will not, he, you know, he, he's not going to solve it. Um, it's understandable what he's doing because he, Clearly, what you cannot do is to um, allow um, a massive reallocation of resources into inefficient uses, such as you give the banks money at zero percent interest, and they basically flip it at huge uh, uh, profits and pay it back out to themselves. That's a, a massive waste, uh, which is not going to solve the problem. But I think what we're really missing is that it is time to retry what was tried in, I think, April last year, which is in the G20 context, sit down and find common rules um, that are drafted um, in a comprehensive way uh, together. Because what we now see is the US is rushing into one area and um, others are not following. Um, ironically, um, the finance uh, function um, in the UK, right, where you're coming from, now has adopted this to be a measure of in a political campaign where the conservatives are saying, let's do what Obama says, and the Labour Party says, oh my God, that's going to kill the city of London, yeah? So that's the worst that we can have. So, and but, I'm just going to throw it open to questions in a moment, but one last uh, comment. But maybe to add, so I, to, 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 to repeat, I really think that the, the way is the right one he goes. Maybe you can always say if politicians do something, you can do it better here, you can do it better here. But the way Obama goes with splitting up the banks yeah, and with dividing really risky um, 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 activities from the basic banking activities is in general the right way. Where I totally agree is that uh, you need to include Europe. I think Europe will be followed because we are actually harder than America, harder in our thinking, or the politicians are harder in the thinking. But we have to include especially Asia. But maybe a, a slightly ironic or a slightly just an idea is um, I sometimes think that especially the Asian banks, they did quite well, the Chinese banks, they did definitely better yeah, in the crisis yeah, than the, the Western banks. Maybe because, and this sounds a little bit weird or ironic because they have a formal communistic system, but at the end, yeah, there are people who own the banks. You have a kind of entrepreneurship yeah, in Asia. You have a kind of entrepreneurship if, for example, sovereign wealth funds own banks, yeah, because there are people who care. 
And maybe the, the issue that uh, the Asian banks are not so much affected is that there have been people who cared while in the really big institutions they have been shareholder managed and actually were shareholder non-managed yeah, because the shareholder doesn't care. This is a problem of our system that shareholders doesn't really vote uh, in uh, or doesn't really take opportunity of their, of their entrepreneurship. Yeah, maybe the Asians are are already ahead of the curve yeah, because they did something in their system what an entrepreneur would do anyway, what we have to, uh, to follow. This is like 1989 when everybody said Japan is ruling the world. We should not forget that three years later we saw the most monumental crash right, that we have seen in the history of financial uh, systems that Japan has not recovered from in 20 years. I mean, China is running open-eyed into a disastrous bubble right now, right? Keeping interest rates... You obviously rates. weren't in the first session because apparently yeah. China's going to save but every, all the, take over the world. I, but I, but I think this is very dangerous. there is dangerous. an owner in China. You have, a, you have a government who has enough money to bail it out because it's their money. I think uh, ultimately, as you said in the beginning, our system will prevail, right? And we have to just make it better. Um, now to say capitalism will lose against, you know, state-dominated... Banks. But it's, it's funny, very you, know, you say this, no, uh, I mean, I I'm, I'm going to throw, throw it open to questions, but I mean, the, the phrase that is used in America at the moment is that the last 25 years was in fact not capitalism, but state capitalism, because every time the capitalists lost money, the state came in and uh, bailed them out. And therefore, you know, what maybe China has a better system of state capitalism than, no, than our uh, rather was, uh, it wasn't a, not to uh, misunderstand more fractured me. I, one. I love capitalism, but I just wanted to say that maybe they're more capitalistic than we are in some ways. Yeah, I just wanted to go back what really capitalism and entrepreneurship means yeah, and to bring in these ideas back into our Western banking system. What I want to say is that maybe the, the banking system in, in, in America and in Europe is not so much entrepreneurship as we would like to have it. Right, uh, do we have well, some questions from... Uh, We've got someone right at the front here. I think we've got a microphone uh, there in the middle and uh, another gentleman there in the middle as well. Yes, hello. My name is Georg Zockel. I'm a representative of the United Transnational Republics. Um, I wanted to point out the United Nations. They have pulled together an expert group which was chaired by Joseph Stieglitz trying to identify what were the root causes of the financial crisis. And they said, actually, deregulation was part of it, but the real root cause was not deregulation. The real root cause was the Triffin dilemma. And the BRIC countries, Brazil, Russia, India, China, did the same analysis. They also said, actually, it is not deregulation. The core of all of this is the Triffin dilemma. And I have the feeling that uh, it is okay. to, to a large audience not known. Who in this room knows about the Triffin dilemma? Well, let me, dilemma? Let me, let me explain I, that very briefly. The Triffin dilemma comes from having a reserve, the, Amer the dollar is the world's Amer uh, reserve currency, which means that America pursues its own uh, interests but infects the rest of the world with the consequences. Right. I think one of the things that I'm actually proposing in the book is that we have to move away from the dollar as a reserve currency to a new global reserve currency. Is that what your question is yes, going to be about? Yes, that is the question. And maybe j just to quickly explain it to the audience, the Triffin Dilemma means um, if you use a national currency as a world key currency for the world markets, then that currency has to become available. And it only can become available if the nation that creates that currency spends it. It has to run deficit. So, and this is what we experienced mm -hmm. over the last six decades. So what's decades. your question? The question is, um, do you know about the proposal of uh, Sir Maynard Keynes of the Bancor of creating a supranational currency and then what, what would your, your position be on it? Thank you. Thank you. Um, as I say, I think this is a very, very important question. Do any of you have thoughts on whether a, a new uh, global currency could emerge? Because as you say, after the uh, Second World War and at uh, the Bretton Woods uh, Congress, John Maynard Keynes proposed the creation of a global currency called the Bancor that America vetoed. Um, one of the things I'm arguing in the book is that America ought to actually propose that currency now as an act of leadership to the world. Do you think there's any appetite for a global currency? No, I don't think they will do it. If you think about the difference between the United Kingdom, which lost an empire 100 years ago, and the US today is that the demand for dollar is something that is saving them on a continuous basis, right? Um, if that, you know, sole reserve currency status wasn't there, China would have um, dropped that dollar pile they have a long time ago. So I think they have no interest in doing it. Uwe. 
Actually, actually, I agree. So if you consider that China at the moment sits on $40 trillion in cash, uh, they certainly do, uh, are also not interested in having now a super currency worldwide because with the $40 trillion, they can do what they do at the moment. They expand their uh, political reach, their economic reach, especially, for, for instance, if you look at their investments in Africa and South America, so uh, the Chinese use, the, uh, in my point of view, the U.S. dollar as a new measure, let's say, of warfare. No. So I also agree that the currency problem is, is one of the, the main routes, but I want to add that it's a little bit like with drugs. Yeah? It, it was like the drug offered to the states and to the governments and at the end to the, to the consumers, but the consumers also use the drugs. Yeah? And it's the one way to think about how to get rid of the drugs, which is actually very important, but we should also think about, yeah, there were people who used it very easily, yeah? so we should not forget yeah, just saying, oh, it was the currency. Yeah? So it was also the people, the system, the financial system, the behavior of the consumers, yeah? and we should not excuse Choose ourselves uh, by saying, "Oh, let's let's get rid of the drug." Yeah, we should also let's get rid of our behavior, which uh, also was one of the main routes. It's both. Okay, we have another question. There was someone in the middle that had a question. Yeah. Jacob Nir David, uh, work in venture capital in Israel, but maybe you could play out a little bit more. Uh, you took it as a as an axiom that we we couldn't let the the system collapse, so to speak, or more banks uh, than Lehman Brothers go bust. Then you said, let's play it out. But maybe if you could play it out. In other words, I know from the VC industry, the crises we've had and then the way we, we came back. Uh, but that represents a very tiny portion of, of global capital. So if you could play it out a little so, more. So from my perspective, you know, what, what was um, going on was that I mean, every, every bank is so interconnected with each other that when one bank fails, it, take, it would have taken probably several years to uh, figure out um, who owed money to who because the contracts were so complicated. Um, in the meantime, uh, credit, which dried up, as you know, in the few weeks after Lehman Brothers went bust, I mean, that would have been uh, much, much worse. So you would have had all those companies like General Electric and others that got into trouble, um, well-run companies, uh, would probably have actually you know, face bankruptcy as well. So you could have ended up with a very significant part of the global economy in bankruptcy, while uh, the government would have, governments would have inevitably had to get involved in sorting out the bankruptcy mess. Um, and then you would have had the problem of all the multiple legal jurisdictions. So Lehman Brothers, uh, which uh, is a global company, is still involved in massive amounts of litigation in London, where uh, I think a bit over a billion dollars of people's private capital is still caught uh, in uh, kind of a limbo because it's not clear about what the legal uh, connotations of it are. So I think we would have guaranteed ourselves something worse than the Great Depression of the 1930s, uh, which again had a philosophy. Uh, the, the government um, before Roosevelt's philosophy was let the banks liquidate, liquidate, liquidate. And as a result, we had 25% unemployment in America. I think what's happened as, as a consequence of the government's intervention, and they shouldn't have even allowed Lehman Brothers to fail, in my view, is that you know, we've now you know, just got a deep recession rather than a Great Depression. But I think my, my learning from this is that we need to, and I think it's why it's so interesting, this group is so interested in this topic, we need to view the financial system as a massive network that's incredibly badly run and doesn't have um, any uh, process for when the network crashes to actually manage that efficiently, rather than what I see happening at the moment, which is all the politicians trying to say, oh, well, let's ring fence parts of the network so that uh, they're not really part of the network anymore, uh, which I think is a historic view that doesn't understand how capital works, and you can't just hive bits of the global economy off and, and, and disconnect it. So I hope that many of the people here will start to actually talk to some of the economists and policymakers about how networks work so that we can actually have a more sophisticated economic regulatory system that is based on a proper understanding of networks rather than this illusion that just because one part of the system is too big uh, that you can somehow ring fence it or make it small and you get rid of the risk. I don't know what you think, Uwe. Well, actually, to, be, uh, to use the uh, uh, 
analogy again, uh, if you uh, put up firewalls to, to actually secure a network, others will find ways to get through the firewall and uh, uh, manipulate your network again. And so I think uh, that's not a cure. And uh, uh, to come back to the question, I think uh, the problem was that uh, Lehman failed because two individuals didn't come along. And uh, something like this should never ever happen. Because uh, only because Lehman failed or was made to fail, uh, we had all this crisis and all these, you know, now development of uh, un uh, unnetworking the network and uh, uh, getting uh, assets uh, unveiled, etc. But uh, uh, going back to this point, uh, if you put too much firewalls up, uh, the, the, the information flow in the network will also be limited, and that will lead to another crisis at, the, at a later stage. Got another one last question. Yes. Um, where, what, what was the role of the rating agencies in all this crisis? Where were they? Yeah. You know, ultimately, it comes down to the most important currency of our modern economy, and that's trust. You know, when we look at this, we only think this is valuable because of trust, right? It's not backed by gold, it's not backed by anything, it's backed by trust. And what happened in this near-death experience is trust dissipated overnight, and the rating agencies played a huge role uh, in it, simply because they had the function of traffic wards, right? It's like you had on an autobahn, um, policemen who were guiding you in the wrong direction and that lost that really left the world blind in a very very precarious situation I think they, they played the, one of the most worst roles yeah but they played it not just by doing their job they played it by existing yeah because I think it's a weird thing if somebody invests money and they were advising investors that he relies on an external one if I invest my money then I should know what I buy so rating agencies if you make it very simple, yeah, don't need to be exist. If, in, if an investor is not able to judge an investment on his own, then he should not do the investment. Yeah, so if nobody would put money yeah, in something he doesn't understand. And I talked to banks, which, which was really weird. You were talking to, to board members, and they were saying, okay, we have 20 billions, we don't know what it is. And I said, would you put your private money, one million, in something you don't know what it is? Of course not, yeah, but it is the money of the bank. Okay. So ra there is no sense for rating agencies at all. So I'm going to ask to, to wrap up each of our panelists to say one reform that they would like to see uh, come out of this crisis that would improve the system. But to, to your last point, I saw a calculation about the, 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 that said that one of the uh, something called a CDS squared, uh, you would require one, to read 1.1 billion pages of documentation to be properly uh, informed about what was in the investment security. And the typical rating agency took 40 minutes uh, to rate uh, at, the, at the peak of the crisis. So, Uwe, one proposal that you would have to come out of this crisis to make the system work better? Well, my point is always treat banks as companies, so let them fail if they, uh, 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 you know, screw up, and uh, if they uh, succeed, let them succeed. But uh, uh, that's, uh, in my point of view, the, the uh, standard uh, uh, rule of the market and, and the, the uh, systematics of the markets. It's a huge opportunity to put into practice what Obama said when winning the election. It's the end of unilateralism. It's the beginning of a new era of multilateralism. And the G20 not only needs to reform itself and give Asia a much larger role in it, but also serve as a forum for multilateral financial sector reform. Just make banks smaller, make them more financed on their, on their clients, uh, more focused on their clients, and uh, at the end, this means bring more entrepreneurship uh, back in the financial industry. Okay, well, I think there are many bigger ideas, even than those, but they're, they're, those would be a start. And I would commend to you uh, my book, uh, The Road from Ruin. <laughs> uh, there's a flyer out there, um, and I'd like to thank the panel for a very stimulating conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.